Good afternoon. Welcome to Barry Interesting. We're bringing local topics into your living room weekly. Hope you like the content. Today's guest is former state representative Steve Cookson. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Barry, for having me. Steve and I have been friends for a long time. We disagree a lot. Uh, full disclosure, he knows I'm a proud Democrat and he's a proud Republican. But part of this show is to bring civility into politics. You know, you can disagree and still be friends. Like I said, Steve and I disagree more than we agree, right? On, on political issues. Right. Sports, maybe not, right? Maybe not. Maybe not sports. So I'm offering Steve's opponents, he has three of them, uh, equal time. They're welcome to come on any time. Just private message me on Twitter, DM, and we'll talk about the issues. But you got to be willing to come into the lion's den and answer the tough questions. And I'm going to ask Steve a lot of tough questions today because Steve's had something that his opponents really haven't had. He's had a front row seat for legislation for the last eight to 10 years. So some people might say Steve's part of the problem. Some people might think he's part of the success, but we're gonna get into the issues today. But first, Steve, tell us a little bit about yourself, your family, and that rich basketball tradition. <laughs> well, uh, mostly it comes from my father, Carol, who uh, goes back to the 50s uh, when he played at Puxico. They played in a log gym and they won back-to-back -back state championships. Many of their players went on to major college uh, careers uh, or professional careers. One of them was an NBA player and uh, they're part of a legend in Missouri sports. They are the Hoosiers were to Indiana, they are to Missouri, the Puxico Indians. And from there, that started a, a legacy that has carried over all the way to through my uncle, Ron, who has won multiple, multiple, more than any other uh, coach in the state, state championships over at Scott County Central. And, um, all the way up to myself, where I played on a state championship team at Advance and with my dad as the coach uh, back in the uh, 70s, early, mid 70s. We, won, we went to the final four and won a couple of state championships during those times and uh, followed me. I was fortunate enough to get to play college basketball for Coach Gene Bess at Three Rivers when we won third in the nation with a couple of good teammates, uh, Otto Porter and Danny Foster, along with uh, my other sophomore teammate, Gene Decker. But uh, since then, I led into a career of education and coaching. Wasn't quite as successful as those guys were always compared, people wanted to compare me to them. But I ran into, and was successful, but I ran into dynasties that were starting up like Ben Bidewell's dynasty over at uh, Portageville. And uh, I realized very soon that maybe I could contribute more in administration in public schools. After I had retired from the public school systems, Someone indicated to me, because I was successful, that uh, I might want to look at running for state office. First, I had not had any, any intention of doing that, and I made the one mistake that I should have known better, because being a school administrator and a superintendent, I said, well, if you can't find anyone else, <laughs> I'll do it. Well. They quit looking and I ran and I was fortunate when by very landslide margins every time I ran for my position there. That's a good point. It does take a lot of courage to put your name on the ballot. It's a, a big deal. It takes a lot of time. Mm -hmm. It takes time away from your family. So yes, it does take a lot of courage to they put your name. They don't call it running for nothing. <laughs> you know, I mean, I ran a lot for Coach Bess 
and training and getting ready to play. And it was tough running to get to go to the gym, but uh, it's, it, it, it is tougher to run for office because you got to yeah. go everywhere, see everybody, and uh, knock those doors. Yeah, you got to drive a lot of fence posts to put up signs. Mm. So, so Steve, let's get in before we get into the issues that we probably are going to disagree on. Mm -hmm. Let's tell us about some of your legislative accomplishments. You served from what 2008 to 2016, or was it uh, 2000? Uh, I believe it was 2010 to 2018. Yeah, 18. Yep. 2018. So, what's some of your legislative accomplishments? Uh, probably <clears throat> towards the end, I was able to. Uh, I was uh, I was chairman of. It took three years to complete, and a lot of times you introduce something at the legislature, and it takes a while for people to start looking at it, and it advances a little farther and a little farther, so that each session, well, that didn't get past this session, but it was a good idea. And, and you start talking with people. So it, it starts out in a better position than just being introduced. Uh, one of them was uh, uh, a new uh, way in which legislation in which all the uh, public universities and colleges, there's 22 of them in the state of Missouri, how they interact with each other and how they uh, have to go before the coordinating board of education. It gives the coordinating board a little more power in the degrees that they get to offer and everything. And it, all, it also allows our community colleges to offer four-year degrees. So Steve, kind of sum that up for us. So your, one of your legislative accomplishments was to have other higher education institutions offer doctoral degrees That's and correct. what about the community colleges you said? That they can offer uh, four-year degrees so that we can bring the degree programs and, clo and the, the students closer together so well, that that's they a great, don't have to travel. So it's a great program. Yes. All right. But Steve, I'm going to cut you off right there because we have to go into the lion's den. You ready to go into the lion's den? Hey, uh, I sure am. I've got a list of issues here that are very important to the 25th Senatorial District. Steve's here interviewing for the job to earn your vote. And we're going to, we're going to take Steve into the lion's den, see if he can answer the tough questions. Steve, welcome into the lion's den. Are you ready for this? I, w I am definitely ready to go head to head with you, Barry. Some people might think this is the hot seat. Okay, you know, maybe it is, but hey, if you can't take the heat, you need to get out of the kitchen. Just remember though, we said civility and politics is That's what we're right. promoting here. That's right. So let's get into hot button issue number one, economic development for Southeast Missouri. What's your plans in the future? What have you done in the past to, pr to promote economic development? We need jobs here. Yes, we do. Uh, we need to uh, move that. Uh, we have been based basically on agriculture down here and agriculture is our number one industry in the state of Missouri. We need to expand on that and bring all of the uh, processes that uh, you know, the ag product and its uh, refinement and everything closer to down here so that we're the places, our people are have good paying uh, jobs that help can sustain a family. Uh, we need to take advantage of our transportation, our, our location here in the, this part of the state. United States with the rivers and uh, the uh, transportation, you know, infrastructure areas. We need to take advantage of that to bring uh, and enhance that to bring it, uh, 
economic development into this area. Well, another issue that feeds in with economic development, Steve, I know it's near and dear to your heart, mm -hmm. is workforce development. Mm -hmm. So you've kind of been a champion of the workforce for Southeast Missouri for eight to 10 years while you're in the legislature. Mm -hmm. So I hear all the time from Democrats and Republicans, we need more education. We need more education. Yes. But there's not a job or award at the end of our educational process right now. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. how, how would you answer that question? What are we getting education for? There's no jobs here. Yes, and we got to make uh, our education, we got to transition it more to skill development. You know, it's, we got to have some basic education. You know, people have to learn to read. People have to learn how to calculate and mathematics. Uh, they have to learn some of the history so that they won't repeat the same mistakes that have happened in the past and it'll stimulate their thoughts towards better ways of doing things. But at the end of the day, they have to have a skill, some kind of skill that allows them to go out and be uh, someone that uh, is able to walk right into a job and have at least the basics, uh, knowledge and skills to go forward in that job. Uh, because that's what, you know, jobs is what they're gonna have to have uh, to have a successful life. Well, let's move on to that because it, it fits right in with our next topic, education. There should be no better expert that's running for the state senate than you. You've had a front row seat for education funding and I've got a couple follow-up questions, but the education, education formula, nobody knows what it is. It's complicated. Yeah. Nobody likes it, but cost of living, student mm -hmm. attendance, economic ability of a community. Mm -hmm. What in the world has that got to do with education? Well, so you've been right there at the front mm -hmm. row. You've been either the problem or the solution. Uh, so tell me what the been, formula is. Uh, the formula is mm -hmm. It, it, it takes into consideration uh, and is supposed to try to make sure that all kids have the same opportunities at the beginning and through their educational career to succeed. However, because of politics and location and the uh, wealth of different areas of the state. Some states are, have uh, captured through dollar value modifiers, they call it in the, uh, more money than other parts of the state. Most of those dollar, fi dollar value modifiers are up in the urban areas. The urban area, I, it's been my, uh, time in the uh, legislature that I was really disheartened by their lack of appreciation for our people. Our, our, they say, I've, I've had them to say, why do you want to even live down there? What, what purpose are you down there? I remind them that if they want to eat, if they want to breathe, if they want to drink water, you know, uh, clean water, uh, you know, then we're, we're important to them. Hey, we produce the things that make their clothes down here. We are the resources. So they need to have more respect for our people down here in Southern Missouri, especially Southeast Missouri, where we have some of the poorest counties in the uh, state and in the nation, quite frankly. Tenth poorest congressional district in the United States, I believe, is right here. That's correct. But I want to get back to education because I think mm -hmm. you're not answering my question. Okay. This education formula, I think it's complicated. I don't think it's fair. I don't think we get our fair share of funding down here. Four or five years ago, Republicans claimed that they're fully funding the education formula. Mm -hmm. But they lowered the bar. Well, so which, where, where's the bar at? Are we fully funding education or is well, it just a political trick? Well, what, what's the real, what's okay, the real issue? I'll tell you what the real issue there was. When we passed gambling, they said that they were going to use that money to uh, 
help enhance funding of education. Well, that was money that was put on top and it wasn't near what they had promised to be and it was slid out of the bottom so that uh, we still didn't get a, a big uh, chunk of it and it went up to the states. So we were sold, uh, the, the gambling lobby really sold us uh, uh, a pig and a poke to say, you know, that we as legislators uh, through, because they had such strong lobbyists and they had uh, passed out a lot of money to get votes to pass uh, this, it did not help education and it uh, actually hurt our funding, but it made it look like we were, they were going to have us at a higher level. So the real answer is we're not fully funded. And you're, well, inter you're interviewing for this job for sure, the Senate of the 25th we are District. Full, we are we're fully funded of the original formula. It was when this uh, uh, gambling money came into effect that that skewed it all. But it seems complicated and it seems like Southeast Missouri is not getting our fair share. Are you telling me today mm -hmm. that you're willing to fight to get oh, I have fully funded. Fighting. We're not fully funded right now, no matter what the Republicans say. Mm -hmm. We're not fully, it's a moving target. It's according yeah. to what you're calling oh, fully funded. Sure, sure, sure. Is it 750, is it 450, what is it? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. Mm -hmm. So are you willing to commit to fully funding education here in Southeast Missouri? As a, you know, as a, a Missourian that's interested in our youth and the future of our state, we have to fully fund it. We have to put more money into education. Uh, and like I said, education that is skill-based, that's going to lead to jobs and bring in uh, economic development into this area because employers want to come to where the, they have employees that can walk in and have a basic knowledge of. To give you an example of that, uh, my son uh, is in the tech industry and his wife. And they say that they have to live in uh, Central California because they have, that's where the knowledge base for that is out there. That we have got to develop more knowledge base. Last year, uh, I started a bill, he got, uh, or not last year, but my last year up there, uh, I started a bill that ended up another rep was working on it too. Senator Leibler was working on it that uh, introduced in our curriculums some basic coding, how to code in high tech industry. Uh, that passed. So now we're trying to get that in, but we got to, we, we were one of the last states to get that. In fact, the state that led the nation in it wasn't California, wasn't out in uh, uh, New York or Massachusetts or uh, North Carolina. It was Arkansas. Arkansas's governor ran on that issue that we got to get ourselves, uh, our workforce out there, better trained for uh, the technology in writing codes and, and things. I don't want to get into most of your opposition to this, this Senate, 25th Senate District campaign, but mm -hmm. one of your opponents gets a rap on him. I don't know if it's positive or negative or whether it's mm -hmm. true or not, mm -hmm. but Eddie Justice is one of your opponents. Mm -hmm. And I talk to superintendents all over Southeast Missouri, good friends with many of them. They feel like he's against public education. Is that a bad rap on him or is that true? Uh, I know Eddie, I've known him, he, and he has supported me in the past. But when he became, when he was appointed to the state board, he was following the, trying to 
enhance himself as a politician and following a, a group that is in their goal is to destroy public education as we know it and to uh, uh, you know give vouchers charter schools they're pushing those things and charters are nothing more than uh, private schools that are using public education, public Which, which takes money away from Southeast Missouri. Oh, right? it does. It, so it you think will. he really feels that way? Yes. Oh, I, I know. I know he is. I mean, you could see his post that he started posting on Facebook right after he got in. He, he was regurgitating what was being fed to him. Well, I'd like to give Eddie Justice a chance to rebut that. I don't know, true or false. But uh, I will give Eddie Justice a chance to rebut that at any time. But let's move on. This is a issue that's near and dear to my heart. I don't think it's near and dear to too many Republicans' hearts, but it's Medicaid expansion. Rural health care has been spotlighted, highlighted through this COVID pandemic, and Republicans for eight to 10 years now have had a chance to expand Medicaid. We've got hospital close, hospitals closing all over Southeast Missouri. Um, rural health care is in a crisis. We don't have many places to go. I mean, we're in a jam here on, in, in the rural areas on health care. So the voters will get to decide in August whether we can have Medicaid expansion or not. I hope they vote for it. 38 other states have it. Um, Oklahoma just passed it last Tuesday. So Missouri is one of 12 states that did not pass Medicaid expansion. And I blame the Republican legislature for that. They got into philosophy instead of what's good for the citizens of the state of Missouri. The federal money for Medicaid expansions in the mailbox, our Republican legislature, all they had to do was pull it out of the mailbox. And they failed to do that and they failed the citizens of Southeast Missouri. We need rural health care. It's a crisis. So Steve, People could say you've been part of the problem or you can be part of the solution. So how did you stand the last eight years when Boy, Medicaid expansion was a hot button item in the legislature and voted it down every single time? First of all, I never got to vote it down. It was never allowed to come to a vote on the floor. I wrestled with it, uh, you know, myself and some other legislators were looking at uh, tweaking some of it and uh, maybe uh, allowing you know some Medicaid expansion that was then uh, today I'm a strong believer in the will of the people uh, if the people voted then they trump my party, my uh, everything. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm for following the will of the people, the citizens. That's my heart. That's where I am. I was being told that Medicare expansion would lead to uh, uh, education defunding and uh, they, they were just telling me a lot of things that, uh, but I kept asking questions and it, I think now that the Chamber of Commerce has even come out in support of expansion and, you know, they're a fairly conservative group, you know, of business people that that will help with our economy and our economic development. I think it deserves definitely a stronger look, and I'm glad that it's coming to a vote of the people. How many rural hospitals have to close, though, for Republicans to get behind health care in rural areas? Kenneth's closed, well, Donovan's so, closed. Yeah. I mean, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, and we were being told that. That was giving me such heartburn up there, but it was being led by those in the urban areas that could care less about us down here. Well, let's move on to a different topic. Transportation, mm -hmm. our infrastructure here in Southeast Missouri, 
It's not the best, it's not the worst, but we're near the bottom on highways and bridges. Senator Doug Labla proposed a gas tax in the past. I think it should have passed, it did not. And you know, our roads and bridges are crumbling. So what are we gonna do about that in the future if we can't raise taxes on anything? Because the Republican legislature won't raise taxes for anything, everything's falling apart. I think it would have passed. First of all, we got to convince the public uh, that, and and as a leg, as a conservative legislator, a Republican, you know, I want efficiency. I want to make sure that our tax dollars are not being wasted. You know, I don't want people just to go have meetings for having meetings. You know, I want to see results. But Republicans are famous for having way too many meetings the last uh, eight years and getting nothing done. Uh, I, that's your opinion. You know, uh, I, I didn't get to go to very many meetings, I can tell you that. Uh, well, let me ask you this question a different yeah. way. I feel like my father-in-law works for MoDOT. Mm -hmm. I feel like those are the people that are the experts on how to spend the money on our highways and our roads. They're not out buying a bunch of new trucks and tractors. I think they're I the people. Know, they're I, the people that I think should have a say on spending the money. They're the experts. And I do know that whenever I first got in there at the legislature, that there was a, a downsizing of MoDOT. You know, a lot of sheds closed. A lot of employees just, you know, whenever they retired or were forced out, you know. So we have less uh, employees in MoDOT than we did have. Uh, so I saw that coming in as maybe we were be trying to become efficient. And that was done under Governor Nixon. Uh, I will tell you that we need to listen to experts. I was for uh, the uh, Senator Libelous plan. You know, you got to have investment. You cannot grow if you don't invest in something, in infrastructure. Roads are part of our infrastructure. And uh, what happened, I believe, in that instance, there were some bad amendments put on it to sink it by those that want no taxes. You know, yes. and I'm not a fan of taxes. I don't want taxes, but I want to live in a, a society and have a government and, and, you know, not have anarchy. We need to keep our services. I mean, Kansas tried to save themselves into prosperity. It didn't work out too good. No, it didn't. I think and they're number 50 right now. And that's what infrastructure. I, yes, and I'm going to tell you. Politics, in my lifetime, I've watched it. It swings a pendulum. And if we, as Republicans, don't use good common sense, we're going to swing ourselves so far over there that it's going to break, and then it'll swing way back over, even farther left than you are, Barry. I don't know about that. Uh, but that's a good question. You just, I just thought of a question. Mm -hmm. As a state rep, have you ever voted against your constituents just because you didn't think they knew the issue or didn't care about the issue? Was there ever a circumstance where you said, well, I think this issue is important to our district, but I'm getting all these phone calls and they're against it, but I think it's better for the district. Was there ever any time you took a vote just because you felt personally that it was better for the district? Oh, I, I did. I took votes that were against the majority of my party. Uh, you know, to keep uh, deer in, under the auspice of conservation and not under agriculture, because I feel like the sport of deer hunting and the management of deer has best been best managed overall by conservation, not not. Uh, I don't want to see us have deer raised out there, and uh, it would be like I, uh, we go on cow hunts, 
you know, you got mm -hmm. a fenced in area, you go out there with your gun and you shoot a cow. Not much sport to it, is it? Not there? much sport <clears throat> to it. No, I don't think Missourians want that. I think that. that's something that a lot of people can agree on, Democrat or Republicans. Well, but it, it was being pushed as an economic, uh, you know, uh, that that's the way we should go is to raise deer and we could sell deer meat at the supermarket and everything. And uh, now, do I agree with everything the conservation does? And uh, no, uh, we have up in uh, the other end of the district and down here in the Boot Hill, we have a real problem with the feral hogs. Getting worse, it's moving it, this direction, right? Yes, yes, yes. And uh, I'm not sure that the answer that's being uh, put out by the conservation department is the best solution to that. Uh, I question that. Well, question Steve, let, let's, let's move on to another hot button issue I think Democrats and Republicans can agree on is rural broadband. Oh, yeah. That, uh, when we talk about infrastructure, that's some place we are way behind. And that, that broadband is always, once again, it's the money that we were given and that we've been able to get all goes to the urban area. Uh, you know, we're gonna have to, this pandemic, if it doesn't show anything else, that we're gonna have to have high-speed internet available for everyone down here our schools, everybody are going to be dependent upon it. All of our, uh, it's going to cost us jobs because of uh, industry's not going to move to here without broadband internet. And people, you know, my <clears throat> son and my, I go back to my son and my daughter-in-law. They have been working from their house, being highly productive from their house because they have broadband internet and can do their jobs from their house. I know uh, right now up in the Capitol, they are a lot of the uh, state workers are working from home on their internet because they have broadband uh, capabilities up there. Let's move on to something that's near and dear to everybody in Southeast Missouri's hearts, agriculture. It's the number one industry here. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make a statement first, and I'd like for you to rebut it or agree with it, okay? okay. President Trump's been the worst president in my lifetime for agriculture with these tariffs, 25% tariffs. The steel tariffs have really damaged farmers. They've lost a lot of equity since he's been president. I mean, if you go buy a grain bin, a truck, or a tractor, or a new shop, the steel tariffs are killing the farmer. And, you know, we're buying everything 25% higher and under President Trump, we're selling everything 25% cheaper. Worst commodity prices in 20 years. Farmers seem to be sticking with him. They're supporting the president. I don't personally don't see how. Uh, it's a checkbook issue for everybody, pocketbook. And I don't see why farmers are sticking with him myself. I don't buy the premise that China's mistreated us well, I do buy the premise that China's mistreated us all these years, but the farmers seem to be taking the brunt of the trade war, maybe all the trade war. So Steve, what can you do as a, our new state senator? You're interviewing for the job. Mm -hmm. and agriculture is a big industry here. Almost everybody here touches agriculture. That's what buys the new trucks. That's what buys the new cars. That's what keeps the economy churning here. So against these tailwinds that President Trump's got us, as a state senator, how can you make a difference in agriculture? Well, first of all, uh, you know, I don't interact with uh, President Trump at this level. I more interact with our governor. And, who is a farmer. Uh, who is a farmer, and I feel like is an honorable man. Uh, but, uh, and I've worked with him in the legislature whenever he was a senator and we worked on the same bills. But as far as uh, our president, I am behind him. As an American, I'm gonna be behind him because I think there, you know, we can uh, talk about 
our issues and every part of the country has different issues. Uh, but I think he's looking out for our best interest because his number one, uh, uh, the number one thing we look for our president is as our commander in chief to protect us so that we can have our life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Uh, so I trust him to stand up for those things. Now, uh, as far as, like you said, as far as trade overseas and everything, trade agreements, I do believe we have been mistreated. Uh, maybe not, uh, uh, I mean, we're being retaliated and the farmers are catching the brunt of that. Uh, the steel industry's catching a lot of that. But there are other things that we have to look at so that we're not taken advantage of by countries like China that has for a long time uh, taken advantage of us. And it's not just China. You know, there's other countries around the world that we are, you know, it's our tax dollars and our money, the U.S. dollar, that's going to them. And uh, we need to eventually keep it home and invested in our own people. Well, let's talk about agriculture at the state level. Governor Parson, Governor Greitens, Governor Nixon, Governor Blunt, as far as you want to go back. Mm -hmm. Governor Holden. Mm -hmm. They always go on these trade missions for the state of Missouri, but they never seem to have any teeth in them. They seem like they're always for show. Mm -hmm. I, I know Governor Nixon took a lot of fellow Republicans, your friends, to Cuba. Didn't take me. I don't remember selling anything to Cuba lately. So does any of these trade missions actually have any teeth? Because I haven't seen it. So are they just for the camera? Or? I think you have a valid point there. I think you have a valid point there. We should hold them more accountable, all of our uh, travel and everything. We need to hold them more accountable. And people think that as legislators, we're given cars and we're given planes and they fly us here. And I can tell you, I drove my own vehicle. I was paid mileage, but uh, it was less than the federal mileage rate. So I ended up wearing out vehicles and barely paying for my gas to go back up there. Uh, well, the state thanks you for that. Well, hey, <clears throat> I, I, I'll, I, it's my civic duty, you know, if I'm elected to go represent those people to the best of my ability. So let's get into some cultural issues that are important to the state of Missouri. You know, Missouri's a red state, very conservative. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How do you stand on the abortion issue? Because a state senator, that's a federal issue. A state senator really doesn't have any say over the abortion issue. Why should well, I care I'm, that my state know, senator's I'm gonna pro-life? I'm gonna tell you, Barry, you know, that is something that goes to my core. Mm -hmm. I am pro-life. I am pro-life. I believe in uh, protecting life from conception to natural death. And uh, I believe in a creator that created that life. And so I, I'm going to be pro-life. But, in, rea I mean, but in, reality, in reality, I reality, is there anything that you can do about it? We can, uh, we can pass laws that, because eventually you say it's a federal issue, a federal uh, mandate. It was federally uh, a federal law because of a Supreme Court ruling, Roe versus Wade mm -hmm. back there, uh, that can be looked at again and overturned. You know, I, I am just, uh, you know, I'm just very pro-life. That's where I am. Well, and I, I, I believe I respect that, that. You know, I believe that that's part of my core. But since you brought that up, you know, mm -hmm. Roe versus Wade was what, 1972, 1973? Mm -hmm. And gay marriage is less than five years old. Mm -hmm. I remember three days after the election, 
President-elect Trump was on 60 Minutes and he said gay marriage is the law of the land. So do you support the president on supporting gay marriage or is it the law of the land, something that's f five years old or less? So I'm confused here on, you know, federal issues versus state issues. Mm -hmm. The president's for gay marriage. How does Steve Cookson feel about that? Well, uh, you know, relationships are different, you know. Uh, Marriage is an institution that has been ordained by God, I believe. And, uh, you know, marriage that we're talking about is a, a contractual agreement that is man-made. That's men, you know, making whether it's okay or not. Or women, you know. So your personal care. beliefs is between a, a marriage is between, between a man and a man and woman. My personal beliefs is, but I will respect everyone because I do believe that every every human being is a uh, created by God, and you know they deserve respect, and I'm not going to judge them. Personally, I'm not going to judge them. They will be judged. Well, let's move on. You know, during this time of uh, COVID, we have uh, falling tax revenues with the state of Missouri. It's going to be even more challenging for a state senator or a state rep to help the governor manage that budget. You know, it's kind of depressing times here. I've seen state revenues were way down. So managing the budget as a state rep or a state senator, what's the process on helping the governor do that? Well, that comes from your, mostly from your chairmen of your budget committees. Now, I have to say, uh, because I was a former superintendent that was not well trusted by the Republican Party, uh, I never got to serve on any kind of uh, appropriations or uh, uh, budget uh, committees. They do a lot of work in everything. They go through the state budget. They look at every department and question all that. I sat in on some of those hearings, but I was not directly involved with them. It so, doesn't sound like the Republicans treated you very good while you were there. You sure you don't want to come over to this side? Well, I couldn't. I, I, I really, I can't. I No, because Fundamentally, I'm a conservative. You know, I am a conservative, and I understand there are Democrats that are conservative too, but uh, uh, not all of them are the crazies that we see on TV, you know, that need to be sprayed with roach spray or something, you know. Let's move on. That's a hot button issue. I'm not sure what a conservative is anymore in these times that we live in, but mm -hmm. we'll save that for a different time. Mm -hmm. Something that I, the only thing I agree with President Trump on is criminal justice reform. So, for example, if, if it was a felony 20 years ago, but it's not a felony now, some kind of minor drug charge, do you think that person should still be in prison today? No, I do not. I believe it's high time we have uh, uh, reform in our judicial system. Uh, and, and when we talk about judicial systems, I'm talking about punishments. Uh, there are some times I think that we need to punish people more, but on these nonviolent uh, issues, maybe we need to give a good hard look at them and, and work. And I would be interested in maybe uh, working and uh, introducing legislation that after so many years, uh, if a person has been to prison or served their time, got out, been a model citizen and everything, and a productive citizen, that they lose that title of a felony. And that's something, that, that's something that can be uh, 
work doing at the state level. It is, it is, and I would be interested in working on that. And that should be some an issue that Democrats and Republicans could work together on. I, I agree, I agree. I think there's a lot of things. Well, first of all, we have to work together. You know, I think- Well, uh, you don't have to, because there's a supermajority in the state I house know, right now. And may, but we need to, we need to. Because we'll, we'll, get in, we'll get into that though, hold up one second. Okay. I wanna get through our list here. We debated this before we come on camera, and I think I changed your mind about it, but you don't have to say this on camera, but voting rights and access to the voting booth, mail-in voting, how do you feel about that? Uh, mail-in voting, I think it needs to be strictly uh, uh, just a short window for, you know, but sometimes people have to travel out, away from their home and aren't there on election day, you know, they still need to have the right to cast a ballot. I mean, we have soldiers out defending our country right now that are sent voting away from their precinct of their home address. So, uh, I'm I'm okay with uh, some mail-in voting, but just to totally open it up, I'm not not in favor of completely. Republicans are always talking about voter fraud, though. But do you, nobody ever proves any cases where there's been voter and fraud. And I don't want to. Do you know any see. voter no, fraud that's no, happened? No, I don't, and I never want to. But you realize, like the state of Oregon, for example, for 20 or 30 years, they've had 100% mail-in voting they get 75% participation in their elections. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a patriotic great thing to do as everybody votes? Oh, I agree, I agree. Uh, you know, we need more, but I, I'm not sure if uh, those, there's those people out there that just don't wanna be involved in anything. They, well, yes. yeah, you know, they just, you know, they're apathetic at, at, in everything in government. And, all that, uh, but everyone that wants to vote, I think needs to have the right to be able to vote. One last issue we're gonna discuss because it's near and dear to everyone's heart in Southeast Missouri is guns. Mm -hmm. You know, Democrats, Republicans, they always get pegged into a corner about being all there for gun control. They want you to own 100 machine guns. Is there a middle ground and should there be a mental health component to owning guns? I think, uh, I think, uh, I think all citizens should be able to own guns. I'm 100% pro-gun. Uh, I believe guns' purpose are for two things, and that is for uh, sport and protection. Sport and protection. Uh, you, a lot of people say, well, do you need a AR to go deer hunting with? Probably not. I've never gone deer hunting with an AR. Do I own an AR? Yes, I do. But, you know, I do know, though, that if I need to protect my house, my property from being burned by an angry mob and the authorities are unwilling to do that, I want to make sure I have my AR and, and whatever else I need to, uh, you know, that I'm able to own. Uh, I don't believe, I believe the law says that we can't have machine guns. A lot of times ARs are considered, you know, machine guns and they're not, you know, they're just automatic rifles, just the same as I have that I hunt with an automatic rifle. Fair enough, Steve. Thank you for being here today. I want to thank, like I said, I want to thank Steve Cookson. He's interviewing for the job to be your state senator for the 25th district. And glad to have you here today. Do you have any parting comments you want to tell the audience in your interview for the job? Uh, I can just want to say that uh, I'm a proud Christian 
American and Missourian that's, uh, and I'm proud of my Southern heritage and my family name. My family name is Cookson. I'm very proud of all my dad, my uncle, and all my relatives. Uh, and I'm proud of living down here with all the, my neighbors. I want to bring honor to my savior, to my country, to my family, and to all my good neighbors. I call them the good folks of Southeast Missouri. Well said, Steve. We'll leave it at that. Thank you for being here on Very Interesting. You did really good in Lion's Den. And I want to offer uh, Steve's opponents equal time. If you'd like to come on and dispute anything that Steve said, I'm sure you'll mainly agree with him, but you're welcome to come on anytime. Steve Cookson, thank you for coming. Thank you, Barry. Hey, and you're still my friend. Good deal. Yeah.